Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. It could be any part of their past, could be what's going on in the news. In fact, we do that quite often here on this show, or maybe even we look into the future with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. Some of you might know me from my other syndicated Beatles show which is called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other regulars. First of all, our musicologist, who writes for Beatle Fan Magazine and a lot of other music publications and for many years worked in the classical department writing articles for the New York Times, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. How are you doing? And hello, everyone. Also a writer for Beatle Fan, who's been with them since the very beginning, uh, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Also, we have Steve Marinucci, who for many years was the writer for Beatles Examiner. And uh, Steve has a little bit of news regarding his status as far as a news writer in the Beatle world for all of us to hear. Steve? Well, as has been announced, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm not breaking any news, Examiner is shutting down as of uh, the 10th. Which means of July. Uh, of July, which means um, I'm gonna I'm moving to other places. I'm not stopping writing about Beatle news as I posted on Facebook and told everybody. I still have many miles to go, as as the, as the old saying goes, and I've got uh, some ideas and some projects in in the works that I will be talking about. Uh, you know, in in you know in the future, but I'm not going anywhere. I have a blog, a Beatle Headlines blog, uh, that um, that if you uh, see me on Facebook uh, in my Beatles news group and on my page, uh, I will be linking to, and I'll be linking on in other places too. But I'll be doing that. I'll I'll be doing some writing on uh, Access.com still, which is related to, uh, which is owned by Examiner's parent company, but obviously not nearly as much, I don't think, as what I was doing before. And not, you know, as encompassing of all the other things I was doing before. But I'm going to still, I think, be doing some stuff for them. Um, and there may be some other things. And I'll, you know, like I said, I'll when things firm up, I will discuss those and, and, and announce those here. But for now, I'm not going anywhere. So you're not getting rid of me yet, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Steve said, he'll be sure to let us know, uh, you know, an update on his situation all of his writings on the Beatles in particular, and we'll be sure to let you know right here on this show. All right, we also have a special guest with us on today's program, and that is Chuck Gunderson. Chuck is the author of the wonderful book called Some Fun Tonight, which uh, deals with the three U.S. tours of the Fab Four, and this book came out in 2013. It's probably the most comprehensive book I've ever seen that deals with all of the shows that the Beatles did here in the United States. We welcome Chuck to our show. Thank you. Thanks for having me back on. I know I'm sounding like a transistor radio, but we're <laughs> going to be vintage tonight. And just think of you all holding up your uh, Pepsi Cola transistor radio like Paul did uh, in the Maisley Brother documentary. Here we right. <laughs> we're doing this to, to give the show more of a 60s feel. Like you're listening exactly. to the radio in the 60s. There we go. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, that's the real reason why we're doing this. Before we talk to Chuck about um, 1966, we thought that we'd talk to him since it is the 50th anniversary and the Beatles' U.S. tour of that year. We just have something uh, that we have to note here, another major passing. Not just uh, someone who was an influence on the Beatles, but a major, a major name in the music world, that being Scotty Moore, who was a great guitar player who's best known for his years with Elvis Presley in the early years, along with Bill Black and DJ Fontana making up uh, part of Elvis Presley's band and on so many of those early classic hits. I thought we'd, uh, we'd all talk a little bit about Scotty Moore and what he's meant to music and also to uh, mix in uh, a little bit of Beatle conversation in that as well. Um, Al, you want to start? Yeah, as a matter of fact, a lot of people forget just as a little little nugget of, of beetle lore uh the fact that scotty engineered ringo's boku of blues album mm-hmm. right and um but more importantly 
he was a just a massive influence. He I think Scotty Moore and Carl Perkins were probably the two biggest guitar influences on George Harrison. You know, one could say that, you know, without uh, uh, without Scotty Moore and Carl Perkins and probably Chet Atkins, you know, George Harrison wouldn't have become George Harrison, you know, because he was such an in- uh, Scotty and Carl and, and Chet were such huge influences on on his guitar style in the early years before he developed his own style. Uh, mm. You know, you can, particularly on those BBC recordings, uh, he just absolutely shines, and uh, um, uh, and a lot of that comes from the influence of Scotty Moore, who's uh, and and it's it's interesting that we're taping this on the actually the anniversary of the day that uh, that Scotty and Bill Black and a kid named Elvis Presley made their first record at Sun Studios. That's all right, Mama, mm-hmm. which you know mm-hmm. totally happened by by accident. But uh, uh, he was um, he was just a, an enormous, enormous influence. Yeah, he really helped to make that guitar solo part of rock and pop singles. Ex- you know? Exactly. He, yeah. You know, he was he was kind of the start of that. I mean, you can't even imagine. We talked about guitar solos before with, when Henry McCulloch passed away with My Love and relating that mm-hmm. to a song like Something from the Beatles. Try to imagine those Elvis Presley records without those guitar solos. And, yeah. and Heartbreak Hotel or That's All Right Mama or Jailhouse Rock or any of those records. It's just so uh-huh. much a part of those songs. Alan, your thoughts? Um, you know, there's, I, I don't know that I can say that much more than Al did. Um, Al, Al put it pretty succinctly. Um, but, you know, I think also people were used to listening to the headliner on a record, you know, which in Elvis's case would be Elvis, <laughs> you know, and just listening to the voice. Mm. But But Scotty Moore was doing so much interesting stuff that, you know, you listen to those old records and, and, and it's hard not to have your attention rested to some degree and, you know, and say, wow, listen, what's going on in that guitar part? You know, I think, uh, um, and I think that became, you know, also an important part of the sort of DNA that led into what the Beatles were doing, you know, not real showy necessarily, but um, important and atmospheric and, you know, had, had everything to do with the song and what was being expressed in the song. And, uh, you know, it was mm. really just a, a, a great stylist. And um, as, as Al said, and I guess we all agree, a, a very important influence on George Harrison. Right. How about you, Steve? I, I am such a big fan of, of early Elvis. Um, and, you know, you may, uh, Al mentioned... Um, that's all right, Mama. When Sam Phillips released the song on Sun Records, uh, they released the uh, uh, on the record. It said Elvis, Scotty, and Bill, and um, you know mm-hmm. that that was kind of that was kind. Of, I mean, it wasn't just Elvis Presley. So, uh, but uh, he he was a, a a great guitarist that influenced so many people. Not just uh, I mean, far beyond the Beatles. I mean, uh, I think uh, Keith Richards said that when he first heard Scotty Moore, he wanted to be Scotty, not Elvis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, there, uh, the, the, there's just so many people, and, and it's so sad that, you know, another great guitarist, uh, at least we have, I mean, we have his music, thank God, um, you know, but he was just amazing. I mean, his work was just astounding. There, there, there's no way of getting around that. So Yeah. Chuck, you want to say a few words about Scotty? Well, I think everything's been said uh, about Scotty. I just meant, I wanted to mention that I was at Sun Studios this past March, and you can just feel the presence of everybody that's passed through those sacred doors. Um, but he was a life force in music. I mean, you're just, <laughs> what can you say? Um, but I think more than anything, um, Scotty was a true gentleman. He's like one of those southern gentlemen. And uh, that's what I really appreciate about him in terms of, of passing on his style so others could adopt it and, and geek, go even further with it. Yeah, I was thinking of, you know, on all those early Elvis records and those guitar solos are so great. One of the things that I think was to mirror what was to come in pop records was that guitar solos were short. 
<laughs> you know, they uh-huh. said so much in maybe 16 bars or something like that, maybe even less. And the Beatles certainly, George knew how to craft that. He, he came up with so many great guitar parts in the Beatles, as did John and Paul, too. But I think that was also perhaps the start of that as well, to say so much with just a little amount of time. Yeah. A uh, matter of fact, there was a piece that, uh, that Ken Womack wrote over the course of the last few days, which uh, ran in the Huffington Post. And he talked about uh, a visit that Scotty and DJ Fontana, Elvis's uh, drummer, uh, made to uh, Friar Park to visit George Harrison in uh, 1999. And they went over to to George's studio and were you know were jamming and uh, Scotty let uh, let George play his uh, you know his his original guitar and all and um, George asked him about the his solo for uh, too much one of Elvis's singles from mm. late fifty six early fifty seven and Scotty said I don't know I don't I can't even remember. How uh, you know how I did that? And George said, "That's okay. I don't remember a hard day's night." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, um, there is a video that was made of Paul with Scotty and DJ Fontana doing "That's yeah. All Right, Mama." Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, I think the 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 DVD was called "Good Rockin' Tonight," right. but uh, really good version. Sounds just like the Elvis version. Sounds just like the way the Beatles did it when Paul sang it. So that's a real fun thing to watch, which you can, you can certainly see on YouTube. So, yeah, very sad to hear about Scotty Moore. All right, let's move on and talk about the Beatles' U.S. tour of 1966 with Chuck. I would just like to start the conversation by asking you, Chuck, uh, before the Beatles uh, came here in '66 to do their tour, obviously we heard about the horrors of everything that happened uh, in the Philippines where the Beatles were looked upon as snubbing the Marcos regime. And they also had to deal with uh, the big controversy, uh, overblown as it was, of the, the Beatles being bigger than Jesus quote from John. Do you think that that U.S. tour, which really only lasted two weeks, was there any joy that the Beatles got from that tour? Because sometimes you get the impression that it might have all been, you know, the Beatles just going through the motions or was it all was it all misery for them because John had to answer to the con- the controversy about the Beatles being bigger than Jesus from the very beginning, and uh, you know they had to deal with all kinds of things like the incident with the Ku Klux Klan and all in Memphis. So you know, was there any joy in that concert? Do you think from the Beatles, or was it the other way around? Well, I think we need to put it in perspective, and I think a lot of times when we think about the 66 tour, it just goes on and on and on, and like the whole 1966 year was terrible. But in reality, uh, well, let's go back to 1965 just for a moment. I mean, they had uh, created you know pop superstardom being at Chase Stadium and, and such success, could do no wrong, releasing great albums, you know, lead the U.S. tour, finish up in the U.K., so really, when 66 starts, I mean, it starts just like any other year. I mean, Brian is beginning to uh, look at booking more tours and working on that. The, the group's working on more records. And, you know, John gives the interview to Maureen Cleave in the early spring. And really, things didn't really start to go bad until the early summer, you know, at least a little bit bad. I mean, you had the butcher cover controversy. Uh, and then, you know, the Cleave comments, although they were printed in the Lo- London Evening Standard in the spring, they didn't hit us until late July or something, mid-July, mm-hmm. late July mm-hmm. when Dayton came out. So they really only had to suffer through a few weeks of kind of pain and misery. Um, and, you know, as you know, touring was starting to, you know, make them wish that they were in the studio more. Um, I, I remember one of them saying to Brian, you know, well, you know, are, are we going to have to do this touring thing every year? Is this going to be an annual event? So, you know, later in the conversation, I'd like to present a theory, but we won't get to it yet. But yeah, I mean, this last little bit of time, you know, the, the month or so that they were involved with touring, sure, it was fun when they're on stage. And I, it's always fun being cheered for and 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 applauded and 
you know, anybody would like that. I mean, come on, if you're adulated that much. But I think for them, it just got to be, okay, well, what's, what's more, you know, what's bigger than what we've already done? And so there was really kind of nowhere to go. You know, they've already been to the apex and they were slowly kind of going down and being more interested in being in the studio. And that's where they went. Right. I do remember you saying that, uh, well, this was according to Bob Eubanks, that he felt that in 1965, he saw a big change in the Beatles by then, you know, and so... Was 1966, you know, to compare 65 to 66, yes, I'm sure they enjoyed being on stage and all, but were they just, because of everything else that happened that year, were they more just weary of it all? Yeah, I mean, they were, I think they were more weary of anything than just just about the touring aspects of it, you know, getting on the plane, of you know, getting to these hotels and parking, you know, they couldn't park on the on the tarmac and go to a regular hangar. They had to park way out in the in the uh, the airport area and had to get bussed in, and so the fans couldn't see them. It was just mm. it was just routine at that point, you know. They would go to a, a venue, they would do a press conference, and even in '66, they they limited the number of press conferences. In '64 and '65, they're doing one in every city. And then in 66, they introduced the, ta- the press tapings where they invited a few select journalists into their dressing room or hotel where they could ask questions. So they didn't have to face the monotony of answering the same questions over and over and over again. So it just became very routine. And, you know, when you've been to the, to the, the apex of your career, it's kind of hard to kind of look to the future and say, okay, what can we do live now that's going to be, that's going to knock their socks off and it's going to make us a lot of money. And I don't think there just wasn't any avenues to go to. They've already, they already went to all the, the avenues they could go to. Hmm. Right. Okay. Who wants to ask the next question? Well, I was going to, I was going to say, Chuck, weren't they really getting tired? They were getting basically pretty tired of the whole thing um and the 66 tour was pretty much kind of a, a real drudgery for them because you know they uh, they endured you know all the the crowds for all the you know the crazy crowds and the cra and the you know the the whole Beatlemania thing and and you know uh, as george said in in the anthology i mean People just went mad, and, and 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 they were all tired of it. And in fact, you can still kind of see, you know, kind of uh, a little bits and pieces of that. The way Ringo and especially uh, Paul and especially Ringo react to to the Beatles now. I mean, you know that. I mean, that really le- last left a lasting effect. And it, especially some of the things that happened on the on the tour. I mean, they they played five shows in Japan. Then the stupid thing in, in the Philippines, and then you know the Memphis, the the blow up in Memphis. I shouldn't say blow up, but the but the the situation in Memphis. I mean, th- this was not a great tour, uh, not a great time for them as far as you know uh, touring, right? Oh, oh, exactly. I mean, and it's really evidenced by the amount of shows they did over the last three years. You know, in 1964, they. We're doing, uh, I think they did around uh, 250 shows or something like that. And then in 1965, they went down to like 78 shows. Uh, and then in 66, they went to like 35 or 38 shows. So it was already starting to happen after that first momentous 64 tour where they did 32 shows in 33 days in the States. It was all already starting to, to go. And, um, you know, Brian was there as their manager and he felt that touring was, was essential to keep them in the public eye. And so he did that. He, he, he booked those shows every year in January. Uh, he got with the promoters. He figured out the touring year. But I'm sure as he was booking shows that the, the group was saying to him, look, and I mean, we, we love the studio. We love creating new music. We always love going forward. We don't want to be on stage playing songs from two or three years ago. Uh, We, we need to, we need to move and have more time in the studio. And we can't have that time if you're traipsing us all over the world. And I think that, I think the nom, the, the word, the word world tour in 1966 is, 
is a little bit misleading. I mean, look, they only went to West Germany. They played a few shows in West Germany. They do the Tokyo shows. They do the two shows in the Philippines. And then they end up finishing up in the States. Not so much of a world tour. Um, but, yeah, I mean, by the time they got to the States and after everything that happened, Germany wasn't so bad. There were some bad questions during the press conferences that they really were just answered really inanely. But by the time they got to Japan and the whole fear over the Budokan and, and, you know, seeing finally seeing signs of, well, not really finally, but seeing a lot more signs of Beatles go home and we don't want you. You know, suffering that whole thing. Then they go to the Philippines and do the two shows in the Philippines, which can you imagine? I mean, it's uh, July in the Philippines and they're up on stage in the afternoon. I'm, I can imagine the, the humidity and all that. They, they do that and the whole debacle with the Marcoses and getting out of the Philippines. Um, they get back to London and, and, and George says, we have a few weeks to rest up before we go get beaten up by the Americans. So yeah, they're <laughs> sick of it. It's like, oh gosh, we have to get on that plane again and endure all this. And then all the stuff that happened in those cities, I mean, in Chicago at the, at the start, you have the whole, you know, apology situation. Um, you know, Steve mentioned the Memphis situation, the Cincinnati situation where they had to spend an extra night and then play a noon gig for the Beatles. That was like <laughs> tearing those guys yeah. out of bed to go do a 12 o'clock noon gig. Can you imagine that? Oh, wow. Um, St. Louis in the rain when they thought they were going to get electrocuted. Uh, you know, it's just by the time San Francisco rolls around, they're, they're ready. They're done. They're they're. They're toast. They, they want to just go into the studio and progress. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, matter, of, matter of fact, we, uh, I think you and I talked about this, Chuck, at the, uh, the, the, the New York Fest. And, uh, well, first of all, you made the point in your presentation, a lot, I think a lot of people have the, the image that the, that entire American tour was in stadiums. And you made the point that it wasn't. Yeah, um, even in 1965, people think that that the Beatles only played stadiums after Shea. And yeah. yes, they played, they played a few stadiums in 1965, but they also played, obviously, the Hollywood Bowl, which is an outdoor amphitheater. They played arenas like the Sam Houston uh, Coliseum, uh, Portland Coliseum, you know, things like that. But the difference was is that Brian wasn't going to have them do one show in those type places in the arenas of the outdoor amphitheaters. He's going to have them do two mm. shows. Mm. Um, so 66 rolls around and it's like one more stadium more than, you know, 65. So yeah, they were also playing um, Coliseum arenas in 66 as well, but, but doing the two shows. Now from a, just from a business standpoint, going into because of all of the bad publicity because of the butcher cover and manila and uh at least what publicity there was from the uh the demonstrations in tokyo and then of course the you know the christ uh, situation was there any nervousness on the part of the of the promoters about the uh, uh about the concerts about well, you know, just, you know, from a, again, from just a straight business standpoint about them, about them selling out, for instance. Yeah, well, after the, the uh, comments came out in Datebook, Brian flew from London to America, to New York, to give that press conference to talk about the statement that John gave and to kind of reassure the press that John had been misquoted. During that trip to New York, Brian met with a lot of the promoters and uh, because obviously the promoters were fearing that, you know, my ticket sales are going to dry up. And I love Brian Epstein. I think he was a great manager. I'm always going to say this. He made a few, you know, bad business decisions, but overall he's mm -hmm. breaking new ground. He's uh, mm -hmm. all of that. And I think also Brian was a consummate professional and gentleman because Brian had told the promoters, saying to them, look, you've been so good to us, you've supported us. Some of you promoters have been with us since 64, like the Ballard, you know, like uh, the Ballards in Toronto or Bob Eubanks in L.A. 
You know, uh-huh. if you've got stagnant ticket sales, you know, let's reduce the guarantees. He was willing to reduce the guarantees. Uh, he changed some of the guarantees for uh, a couple of the promoters. But Brian was prepared to cancel the entire tour, uh, knowing that he would lose, you know, a couple million dollars. He was prepared to do that. Uh, but the promoter said, no, let's let's do it. GAC, you know, reassured the promoters it's going to be OK. Let's just continue on. Um, but it, it, the 66 tour, the, at least the American side of it, was very close to just not happening at all. On what basis yeah. would he have canceled it? Simply on on if the promoters felt antsy or was it about the Beatles safety as well? I think a, a combination of everything. Number one, the promoters not, you know, taking a huge risk because the promoters are paying huge guarantees, anywhere from fifty thousand dollars upwards of uh, seventy five, eighty five thousand dollars just for the guarantee. Plus, they were shelling out, you know, sixty five percent of the gross ticket sales as well. So, you know, the promoters obviously once. August hit and the shows were two weeks away, they saw a significant reduction in ticket sales. Mm -hmm. And also, I think Brian was thinking about the Beatles' safety, obviously, and uh, he loved them. He didn't want anything to happen to them, obviously. And so I think, you know, safety was a factor, and I think maybe even the fan safety was a factor. Uh, this was a huge news event, and um, you know, you, you we see a lot of news clips of protests about the Beatles coming to their town. Uh, I ran in, into a fabulous cache of documents when I was doing the book about the Memphis shows, and uh, about three weeks or so before the Beatles arrived, the Memphis City Council actually passed a resolution not welcoming the Beatles to their city and actually putting pressure on on early Maxwell, the promoter, to not hold the shows in Memphis. And it actually took a bribe by early Maxwell to the mayor. His his name was Ralph Ingram. It was I, I acquired his whole file, so I was able to go through it. But in the very back, there's a letter of donation and actually, it's post-dated to December of 1966, but it's a $500 donation to his campaign. Um, uh-huh. But it was in his file marked Beatles. <laughs> so uh-huh. my, my, my inclination is that he kind of greased the mayor's palms to let the shows go on in Memphis. Wow. That's something. Hmm. Chuck, did any of the shows in 66 sell out at all? No, um, that's a great question, and Ken, because uh, the only show that ever sold out was the Shea Show in 1965. Um, a lot of the shows sold out in 64, but after Shea, no other sold show, American side, sold out in 1965 or 1966. Wow. 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 Uh, I, I knew I knew some of them didn't sell out in '66, but I did not know that about '65. Wow! Yeah, there was a show in in my hometown of San Diego uh, where they held it at Balboa Stadium on August 28, 1965, and they could have accommodated around 29,000 people, and they had an attendance of 17,000. This is, uh, you know. 10, 12 days after the Shea Stadium concert. Mm. I mean, you could have went to San Diego and walked up to the to the ticket office that day, that five minutes before the show, during the show, and got a ticket and could have got in. For under five bucks. What do you attribute it? <laughs> yeah. What do you attribute that to? I attribute it to uh, a lot of people think, well, gee, why didn't they sell out? Well, you have to remember, these are huge venues, and rock and roll is yeah. is not a was not a usual tour de force to uh, sell out uh-huh. the stadium. Now, if the New York Jets were, were playing in the Super Bowl or something, they're going to sell out that stadium. But, you know, right. rock and roll wasn't selling out huge, huge venues back then. And to attract 30, 40,000 people to a rock concert back then was, I think, a really high achievement to get that many yeah. people there. Because it just wasn't like we know it today. 
You right. know, if you go see some of these super groups that can can sell out stadiums, um, I'm thinking about this this uh, Coachella festival that's coming up, this three day festival out in California where you know Paul's playing and the Stones are playing and Roger Waters mm-hmm. and and these the Who and these fantastic groups and there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people there. So it's just you just have to chalk it up to the times. Uh, in 19, the mid sixties, I mean, to attract 30 or 40,000, that's a huge number of people to get to a, to a music concert. Hmm. Well, Chuck, do you have data on, yeah. on the makeup of the audiences? I mean, you know, these shows today, people like us go to them and can afford prices of tickets and all of that. And, and, or, or some of us can and in, 19, <laughs> in 1966, I, I think a lot of the audience might have been, you know, maybe 12 to 17-year-olds and maybe their parents coming and taking them along. But it was a, it was a fundamentally different kind of thing in terms of, 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 of who was going to these. And that could, could also be why they didn't sell out. But do you have data on, on what the makeup of the audiences were? The data that I had in doing the research for the book were I saw literally, well, thousands maybe, thousands of photos of, of crowd shots at different venues. Uh, you know, no one wants to have a bunch of crowd shots in a book. You know, I only included a few. Mm. But uh, looking at these crowd shots, especially in different regional areas, um, number one, there wasn't a lot of African Americans and or minority, other minority groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was mostly white America. It was mostly uh, kids aged about anywhere from about eight, seven to eight at the lowest, upwards into the high teens, early 20s, Um, maybe one to two parents, usually one uh, that would. I had many fans that I interviewed and they said, my parents dropped me off at Shea Stadium and they told me they would come pick me up. <laughs> you know, it was just those, those times, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had another girl tell me I lived in San Diego. I got free tickets to the Hollywood Bowl in L.A. And my parents drove me up to L.A. They dropped me off at the Hollywood Bowl and they went down and had dinner on the Sunset Strip and came back and picked me up. And she was like nine. (laughs) So, yeah, that was pretty much the demographics of Beatles shows. But, yeah, not a lot of minorities and and um, older, older people. And overwhelmingly female. Yes, overwhelmingly female. (laughs) Not like Paris. (laughs) Right. boys. I think you know. Um, we we hear. I'm, I know you've obviously seen the footage of um, Shea Stadium uh, when fans are being interviewed and saying, you know, aren't, isn't it over with basically for these guys? And and the fact that whole sections of the stadium were a little more sparsely filled than in '65, or you know, and I think if. If the Beatles were a normal group, which is the uh, assumption that the the press guys seem to be coming with, um, that could have spelled the end of the Beatles. Okay, no one's coming to these tours anymore. But I think it was probably because they weren't a normal group, that they that they were at this point completely bifurcated between the studio and and live, that um that, that assumption was, you know, not fulfilled. And and the degree to which they were bifurcated, I think, is evident in the fact that their current single, Yellow Submarine, wasn't even in their stage set. You know? Well they could have never they never could have recreated Yellow Submarine on stage as well, uh, along with, you know, Tomorrow Never Knows or even some of the easy got to get you in my life. They couldn't recreate that. They'd have to get a horn section on there. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think you're you're right, Alan. And the reason is, is what's what's really interesting is if you watch the news footage from the 66 Shea st- show where they're going around interviewing fans, there's kind of a shift almost in terms of what the fans are talking about. And the shift being is that the fans are talking about the music and how it makes them feel. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about seeing them live on stage. It's more about their music is great, it makes me happy, and if they keep playing music, they're gonna be around for a long time. 
Mm-hmm. It's nothing. There's not. I didn't see any interviews where I was like, oh, I'm so happy to be here and it's going to be so great to see him on stage. And I can't wait to see Paul and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, you see all that in 64 uh, with those interviews with the fans in New York. And I like George's eyebrows and I think Paul's nose is cute. There's a complete shift in 66, at least with the news footage. I'm sure there was a lot of kids there obviously wanting to see them in person. But at least the kids that were interviewed were more talking about how the music made made them feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any chance, Chuck, that the the sales figures for each show might be somewhat inaccurate? Because if the stadium reports less sales than there actually were, maybe they didn't have to cough up more money? I, uh, you know what? <laughs> Brian was very uh, good. He, he and GAC. GAC, his uh, tour company that he used, General Artist Corporation, those guys were sharp, and they carried along the tour with them accountants, and they collected the money. If they did two shows, they collected the money in, before the second show started. And I saw balance sheets from all the promoters as well as GAC balance sheets, and they all matched up. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think Brian was very aware of what he was getting and what the stadium was reporting, and I think it was very accurate. Um, there might have been some slushiness in terms of program sales, because you have to remember the only thing that you could buy at a Beatles concert was programs. That was it. They were right. a buck. Uh-huh. Right. You showed up, you yeah. bought your, your program. There were other people out there, but they were not authorized by GAC or we hauled them out of there. But, you know, the only thing that was kind of slushy was the program sales. Uh, because there's accounts of, of Brian pocketing a lot of that money, that cash money that would come in those dollar bills for the programs. Some of the photographers mentioned that to me that were on the plane with them, that they would have like a, a you know, an old sack of money they'd bring out to play poker, you know, and they'd use these dollars to, to play with. But it wasn't a lot, probably. I don't think Brian ripped them off. Um, I think he shared shared equally with them just to have some fun with a little bit of slush money. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But we know in the Philippines that uh, the government or whoever, the officials there, took most of the money that they made on those shows. Now, it's, okay. it's very interesting that the last show was at Candlestick Park in San Francisco because at that moment in time, uh, there was a whole different kind of music um, scene emerging in in San Francisco, and a little bit of that actually seeped into the promotion of the uh, of, of the Candlestick Park show. Exactly. I mean, I think the, the, right. first, the first thing, uh, Al, is the poster. Yes. Uh, the, exactly. Yeah, designed, designed by Wes Wilson. I mean, a well-known psychedelic poster artist up there in San Francisco. So that that crept in. And then also the promoters, which was um, uh, Big Daddy Donahue. Uh, uh-huh. Oh, the other day, Bobby, Bobby Mitchell. Yeah, Bobby Mitchell, who ran Tempo Productions. And they were very cutting edge forefront DJs that were showcasing a lot of the new music that was uh, showing up on the West Coast, especially in the Golden Gate, San Francisco era. But yeah, that was definitely definitely there. There's definitely a, a vibe of that. And, you know, when they were looking at doing that last show in San Francisco, the original plan from GAC was to do two shows at the Cow Palace again to end it. Um, and after thinking about it, they were also going to do a show in, uh, at the fairgrounds in Louisville, Kentucky, and Brian scrapped that. But um, the uh, GAC uh, said, let's, you know, let's just do the same format we've been doing every year. We'll do two shows at Candlestick or at, at uh, the Cow Palace and we'll, we'll end it. And then GAC came back with a telegram to Brian and said, you know what? Candlestick Park's available. We can just do one show there in and out and be done with it. I, we recommend that you do Candlestick Park. So, you know, there's so much lore about Candlestick Park and all of that. Wouldn't have yeah. been interesting if it had said, okay, we'll do the two shows at the Cow Palace and, and be done with it. But I think they had some great memories of the Cow Palace because that last show in the 65 tour to end it, which was the 31st of August, 
That uh-huh. show, those two shows, um, there are several photos in my book. I dedicated a lot of space to those last two shows in the book. It was wild. It was out of control. I mean, fans were on the stage. You know, fans were throwing chairs. Show, you see fans lying all over the stage. It was completely out of control. So GAC and Brian were smart. Hey, let's put them at second base at Candlestick Park. And I'm always interested, too, as in terms of why did they put this huge circular fence around? I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. They had never done that at any show. And the uh-huh. only way I can sum this up or think of, think why they did that was it was the last show of the, of the tour. And maybe they felt like, you know, fans would rush the field. Um, I think there was just some extra precautions with that last show. I don't think the fans were sitting there thinking, well, this is the last time I'm ever going to see the Beatles. I don't think anybody knew yeah. uh, on no. the fan side that this was going to be the last show. But I think they just put some extra precaution into that last, knowing, you know, the fans knowing that this is going to be the last show in America just for that season. So they, they added that fence, that extra security. But it's, it's just such a sad shot of them yeah. playing this enclosed fencing um like almost like cattle you know uh playing in there yeah yeah kind of kind of a sad ending actually when you think about it and that place wasn't the most hospitable place it was freezing at night it was absolutely having having seen some night games there and can you can you probably you probably got an inkling of well not really because it was actually a mild yeah. night a mild night when we uh, when we went to the McCartney show but there yeah. were, I, I I attended some games there that were absolutely freezing and apparently from Paul's comments on stage it was cold that night um, yeah. and so it wasn't the nicest place to play and uh, so they were you know that was another reason to to get out of doing that stuff so they wouldn't have to put up with that stuff, you know, put up with those kind of conditions. I mean, the, you're talking about the rain, Chuck, uh, you know, and, and I remember that the one uh, when they were in Holland there and the, it was pouring and they all had the umbrellas. I mean, oh, God, that, uh, you know, the, you can only endure just so much of that stuff. And they really, they really got it hard. I mean, that they really endured the worst of that stuff. Some of the, I, you know, I don't know that anybody's ever. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Mark Lewis and will eventually when we get the other books. But you know, the real, the real blistering of what Beatlemania did. I mean, it was not. It wasn't all fun, really. And and uh, uh, you know, it really. I mean, you can tell that it changed them. It really did. So yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the show about a, a theory that I have, and, and I'm hoping that Mark Lewis and maybe, if he's listening, to, to bring this to light. But, you know, every year, Brian kind of booked the whole concert year in the early months of the year, namely January. And we know in 1965, uh, you know, he had planned them to do some spring shows. He had planned them to do some summer shows, and he had planned to do some fall shows. So I guess the question I have is in this in the in the new year of January 1966, you know, Brian's thinking about, OK, what are we going to do to tour this year? Because that was an ingredient every year, what they 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 put in. And he said, OK, well, yeah, let's uh, let's maybe go to Germany. We haven't, you know, I like to go back there or let's go back to the Orient. You know, let's go do this thing in the Philippines. We're going to come back to the States. But did he also add something in the UK in the fall of 66 and maybe presented it to promoters in 65 they were playing theaters still and you know after they'd done this stupendous thing so maybe there wasn't Mm. large venues in the UK you could go to I mean there was Wembley and things like that but I kind of wonder you know like if he was planning anything for the fall I'm sure when they played the NME show in 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 may of of uh, 66 which was uh you know the last show in britain they'd ever do were they thinking well this is it we're never going to play another concert in the uk or did they know that in the fall they were coming back and they had to fulfill some obligations in the uk in the fall of 66 i i you know i i like to talk to mark about it 
to see if there was any kind of something in Brian's diaries or calendar or other businesses or other promoters that he had dealt with who will come out and say, well, yeah, I mean, they were going to do a show here in this town in October of 66 as part of this tour. But Brian called it off after the uh, America because they just wouldn't go out and do it anymore. Mm-hmm. But John was John was committed to <laughs> how I won the war for you know right? in, into the fall, and that started fairly soon mm. after the summer tour. So he would right. have to have known fairly early that he wasn't going to have to go on tour, and that they could then go into the studio in November. Right. But he was, you know, he was done with how I won the war, and they could have easily fit a five or six week tour in there. Hmm. Yeah, something to think about. Sometimes, mm. sometimes I wonder if the Beatles knew before they started the U.S. tour of '66 that this would be the last, because there are those moments during the tour where they 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 say in interviews that we'll be back next year. Yeah, they they do, and um, you really don't start hearing it. And of course, all of this is is post touring. You know, you really don't hear about it until about uh, the the Candlestick show. You know, of uh, hey, this is around the St. Louis show when you know it was raining and um, they were loaded into a into a freight van afterwards and taken back to the airport. And they're rolling around in the back and, and, and John or Paul finally saying, yeah, this, this touring is a bloody lark kind of giving in to the other two, namely George, secondly, John saying we're sick of touring. We're, we're done with, we're, we're, we're toast. We're done with us. Hmm. Yeah. Chuck, you want to say a few words about the opening acts? One of the things that I love about your book is that you devote a certain amount of time to each of the opening acts from each year. So for people who wonder, like myself, how did Bobby Hebb become a part of this? You know, how did, um, you know, The Circle, you know, bands like those, The Ronettes, how were they opening acts for this tour and the remains for that matter? It was namely GAC, General Artist Corporation, that kind of put together the package show. And uh, again, this is a different time, different age. When people went to rock concerts back then, you know, you had to sit through a supporting show to, to get to the mainliners at the end. And as you know, the Beatles came on and played 30, 35 minutes. But they were generally selected by GAC. Um, there's a couple instances where I know specifically that one of the Beatles asked for, you know, a group like in 1965, Paul uh, really liked Cannibal and the Headhunters. They had that huge hit, you know, the Chris Kenner song, Land of a Thousand Dances. And he said, I want the Na Na Boys on tour. Uh, We know when the Righteous Brothers quit in 1964, there was a, a booking agent that worked for GAC by the name of Bob Astor who asked his uh, managed client, which was Frogman Henry, to join the tour. So it was namely, namely GAC that kind of looked at who was making hits in America at the time and who would, who would be popular. And look, the, re- the remains were, were doing well. You know, they were kind of this, I don't know, proto-punk band out of Boston. <laughs> right. getting, a, getting a, a slight following. You know, Bobby Head had that huge hit in Sonny. I mean, everyone right. was singing something, you know, and of course the Ronettes, uh-huh. you know, you can't beat them uh, being on stage. So that's kind of how to make, that's how it kind of worked. There were also- Sometimes you wonder, there, in the case of the Ronettes, since the Beatles knew them, you know, they met them in 64, if they had any influence in that. Yeah, probably so. And also with the Circle as well, because the Circle was right. a Brian Epstein, right. uh, yeah. Nat Weiss managed band. Right. So right. obviously Brian's going to want to get the word out on the circle and have him showcased. And there they were, had two huge hits, Turn Down Day and Red Rubber Ball. There were also some yep. room, some rumors about the about the Ronettes and the Beatles anyway, you know, about some uh, messing around going going down there. So that isn't totally surprising either. Um, yeah, and there's there's pictures of them on the plane with the Beatles, and they're you know they're very friendly with them. They're sitting on their laps and things like that. So Ex- except that was the tour, I believe that uh, that Ronnie was not with them, uh, right? Uh, because because well, Phil, Phil wouldn't yeah. let Phil wouldn't let her go. 
<laughs> right. Phil didn't want to let her go, and so she was replaced by Nedra mm-hmm. Valley. Right. So, oh well. I still would. I've. I, I. There. There are recordings of some of them out there, of shows from that that year, and they. I mean, they all sound pretty good. Uh, oh yeah, there's a complete show from Toronto that I listened to. All the opening acts and the whole Beatles show. It's mm-hmm. not out, <laughs> but I got to hear it, and it's amazing. I mean, you know, Maple Leaf Gardens horrible amplification system. Uh, but still, I mean, it was it was really good. Is is that the one that has the um, the fan stuff too? Because if that's the one I'm thinking of, when it uh, got auctioned, uh, it got uh, that got auctioned, I believe. And when it got auctioned, the auctioneer sent me highlights of it and allowed me to post it, and I did. And uh, it was interesting. I, it was the first time I'd heard some of that stuff too. I don't know that I've heard the whole whole thing. But I, I I heard a good chunk of it, as I recall. Yeah, it, it's great. And then you also have to remember um, there was one instance during the 66 tour where it was in St. Louis, and with the rain and everything, they thought, hey, let's get the Beatles on stage. So the remains open up. Bobby Head goes on after the remains, and then the rain starts to really get menacing. And so they put the Beatles out next. And then the circle... And the Ronettes finished the show. <laughs> wow. Terry Tash wow. told me he was the of the remains. He said, he said, that was the only standing ovation we got, but everyone's back was turned because everyone was leaving. <laughs> 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 they had seen the Beatles, you know, so we had to come out and do our, you know, we had to back, uh, the, we had to back the Ronettes and everyone was leaving, <laughs> leaving. And he said, that was the only standing ovation we ever received. You know, I, I I think the I think the Memphis thing is is interesting to discuss in light of you know the recent events about the about uh, um, security situations. I mean, they that really had to frighten the hell out of them. Um, uh, I I can't imagine. A friend of mine was at that show, and he's told me uh, what it was like, and he said, you know, and and you can just imagine. Uh, everybody just freaking out. I guess John, they all looked at John because they all thought something had happened to him. But boy, that must have been frightening. That must have been just amazingly frightening. Well, and, and you know, if that would have happened in 1964, I don't think anyone would have paid notice to it. But in 1966, in 1966, in Memphis, after you have the Ku Klux Klan men giving his famous... Mm-hmm. Uh, interview yeah. on TV mm-hmm. before it even showed up, and all the all the issues going on with the city council, with the religious leaders, with parents, and all of that. But if you listen to the to the the actual concert, um, it happens when George is singing. If I needed someone, you know, it goes off. Those guys are consummate professionals. They never missed a beat. They just kept going on. So I'm not. <laughs> They glanced at each other, you know, briefly to see if anyone had fallen over. But they just kept on playing. And then you continue to hear the show like nothing ever happened. It's the craziest thing. They never mention it. Nothing. It's just it's just kind of one of those things that happened. And, and they just, you know, the band played on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But boy, in light of in light of today, for example, like I said, you know, I mean, that just must have been. I mean, they obviously didn't have the security that they do now because obviously somebody was able to get through with with firecrackers. But boy, wow! Well, the show after that in Cincinnati was probably even worse because you know they're sitting mm. there at the Crosley Field, waiting out a rain delay, just sitting there, you know, wanting to get this thing over with. They did not stay in Memphis. Um, that night, you know, they high, they hightailed it out of there. And so they were mm. flying this late night flight into Cincinnati. They pull into the Vernon Manor. They, you know, get some sleep. They have to mess around Cincinnati in the hotel room. They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. They can't see anything. Uh, then they go to the, to the, to the gig. They, you know, they don't do a press conference. They're doing press taping. Uh, waiting around all that time, you know, to, to, to get in and get out. And then for it to be canceled, they hustle them, have to hustle them back to the Vernon Manor. The Vernon Manor is not a great hotel. Okay, It wasn't a good, a good part of town. 
uh, wasn't one of these really magnificent hotels. Some of the, you know, it's not like the plaza or something. So, you know, they, they're waiting around the next day and then they tell them, oh, by the way, you know, you got to get up early because you got to be back at, at the place at noon. Well, they're not showing up at noon. They're, they're, they're getting there probably about 11 because they had to get the support acts on and all that. But they still got to travel over there. They're probably up about nine in the morning. Then they have to do this show in Cincinnati in the summertime. You know, it's over 100 degrees and the humidity has got to be 100 percent. They're under this tarp, which is the funniest thing because the, the promoter, you know, was supposed to put a tarp on the night before, but he's too cheap. He didn't do it. And that's why it was canceled. So then they put the tarp on during a sunny, hot day. <laughs> no one in the upper stands could have saw Ringo at all because he's under this tarp drumming. It was just a disaster. And then they, you know, they 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 leave the same day after that show and, and go to St. Louis by plane and they have to do a show that night. Mm-hmm. So you can see how they're getting just sick of this thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chuck, didn't you say I thought there was an announcement on Facebook that uh, some fun tonight's going to be carried by a, a publisher, a major publisher? Yeah, um, I just uh, gave the title to them, Hal Leonard. They're a great group. They've been around for a long time. Um, You know, when you're an independent, I'm not like a Mark Lewis where I have a big publishing firm behind me. And when you're doing it by yourself, when you're doing everything, you're you're trying to get interviews, you're trying to market it, you're shipping the things yourself, you're, you know, doing all this stuff. And uh, Hal Leonard approached me and said, hey, you know, we're interested in your title and would you consider it? And they gave me their pitch and I liked it a lot. So basically they're selling the remaining deluxe versions, which are the two volume hardbound set in the slipcase. There's only a few left. So, you know, if people want to get them, they need to go get them before they sell out because those will never be reprinted again. But what they decided to do was offer a um, soft back version nothing's been changed it hasn't been edited everything's the, still the same but it is in soft bound um, you're not going to get the glossy pages as it was in the deluxe version but everything's the same and you can buy each volume separately so if you only want to get volume two which covers the 65 66 tour you can do that and i know amazon i looked the other day i think they're selling them for about 28 dollars so it's a good deal. Oh, wow. it's, a, it's a good yeah. good history and, and lots of good, you know, hundreds of unpublished photos and memorabilia and documents. And, I, you know, obviously I printed the documents really large so you could read all the fine print. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's 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 the deal. So you can get them much anywhere. You can get them on Amazon. You can go to your local bookstore. They'll probably carry them. Um, so that's, that's what happened. I'm very, very happy that that's the way it, it, uh, it ended up. Will the paper bound yeah, version be the same size? Yeah. Will, will they be same the same size? size? Everything, oh, everything is the same. Yeah. Everything right. is the same. Yeah. Just a soft, soft bound, uh, front. Oh, good. Uh, will that's- you have copies of either version at the, uh, the Chicago Fest? The paper, the soft bound version won't be released till September 1st, oh, but okay. I will. I will be at the Chicago Fest selling my remaining deluxe versions, which I think I only have about 30 left that I'll be selling there. So if you want to get them, you better get them because I, I don't think I will be appearing at the New York Fest next year with hardbound versions. Uh, oh, okay. So get them, get them while they last. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Chuck, we're we're pretty much out of time here. This has been absolutely wonderful having you as a guest again. And uh, kind of like, uh, you know, on Saturday Night Live, they have that, uh, what is it, the five list of people who have uh, co-hosted the show. Uh, you're, I think you've been on the show now three three times. So yeah, three probably... Times. Uh, we, did, we did all three know. tours, which was great. So if you want to... If you want to concentrate on a particular city or something, we can do that. Because every city they went to, I guarantee you, is a great story behind it. <laughs> you're uh, we'll get even more specialized. Yeah. Chuck, yes. you're do, you're doing you're doing. I know, and this is going to kind of coincide with when we publish it, so it may not it may happen before we get on this thing gets on the internet. But you're doing the, a program at the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles. But I'm wondering where else is the exhibit going? 
we just opened up at the Grammy. Uh, that's the Ladies and Gentlemen, the Beatles exhibit, which is a part of my group called Fab Four Exhibits. And uh, we've been touring for the last two years. It's a large scale Beatles exhibit that tells pretty much the American story, arrival uh, JFK, February, but we do go into the early period, but we end about 66. So um, that's been touring for the last two years. We just opened up at the Grammy Museum in LA. It's a, it's a smaller version of the exhibit um, and it will be there till about, I think the 5th of September uh, and then we we go to the uh, William J. Clinton Presidential Library beginning in September. Wow! And we, yeah, we'll be there till uh, <laughs> we'll be there till April. And from there, I'm not too sure, but at least you're covered until uh, next spring if you want to go see the exhibit. It's amazing the artifacts, the the story. Um, we finally added a new artifact uh, in Mississippi. We have Ringo Stars. Hard Day's night suit, the, the complete suit. Mm. Uh, oh. Russ Lee's, uh showed it to me at a local Hampton Inn. He just unzipped it and laid it on the bed at a Hampton Inn in Mississippi. And I'm looking at this thing going, wow. Because it had been the first time uh, it had been seen by the public uh, since Ringo wore it in Hard Day's Night. And then you're doing something, again, like I said, uh, by the time the show comes out, it'll probably be done. But you're doing a, a live thing with Bruce Spicer and... Um, somebody that was at the Sullivan Show at the Grammy Museum this week, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, this, yeah, this Thursday I'm going to travel up to the Grammy Museum. I, I'm going to give uh, some private tours of the exhibit both Wednesday and Thursday. So if anyone's interested, then call the Grammy Museum and get a ticket for that. Uh, but the symposium is Thursday night at 7.30 along with Bruce, Russ Lease, and myself, Bob Centelli, the executive director of the Grammy and uh, also someone that went to the Sullivan Show. And before we leave, I'll also add one other thing, is that the Ron Howard documentary is coming out very soon, and right. I've seen the complete version of that. Ooh, oh, wait a minute. You can't, we're, we're not going to let you... Not, yeah. yeah, we're not going to get away without talking about that. No, what did you think? Well, um, I can't say anything because I signed a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <I can't> <laughs> <laughs> I'm an honest guy, and I'm going to keep to that. But I, I have, I have helped them quite a bit on the documentary with uh, the history, with artifacts. They've used my book, obviously, for the U.S. part of the documentary. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it in total, and um, I'm anxious for it to come out. I was going to ask you: is uh, uh, since the uh, exhibit's going to the Clinton Museum? Uh, is the pre- is the former president going to uh, have? Or have you had any contact with him at all? Well, that would be interesting. You know, it really it's not on their website. It hasn't hit their website yet. I think they won't do any pre marketing for that until about I'm thinking late August. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I get a call from a Secret Service agent or something, then I'll know <laughs> something's going to happen. I guess. But, uh, so I don't know if President Elect Clinton will be there. I don't know if Bill will yeah, be there. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, really. An, inaug- an inauguration get, invite? Uh... No, if I get frisked at the door, I guess I'll know what's happening. So yeah, right. That's true. Well, good luck with that. So that'd be interesting. It'd be fun. Yeah, um, it's a great. We were at the LBJ Library. We set the we set the attendance record there for any other exhibit, including LBJ exhibits that have ever been there in that museum. Huh. The Beatles exhibits. Wow. So wow. wow, really? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, so we have a, that's interesting. Yeah, we had a great, great experience there. So hopefully the exhibit can continue. We're, we're kind of running to an end of our contract with the Grammys. It comes up after the Clinton. So I know they're interested in renewing it, but we have to see if we want to continue on with them. Okay. Well, good for you. But it's been fun. Yeah. Well, Chuck, Chuck, this has been yeah, it's been great having you as our guest, yeah. and of course, yes. we welcome you on whenever you want to be a guest on the future. Just, you know, let us know. There's so yeah, many things we can a, talk about a, as far as or, yeah, or pick a city. Like if they showed up in New York, you know, three years in a row, there's a lot to talk about, or a particular city. Mm-hmm. The New York thing, the New York thing, would definitely be interesting. If uh, if any of our listeners want to get in contact with you, Chuck, how can they do so? 
Um, they can get uh, in contact with me through my Facebook page, uh, which is the Some Fun Tonight page, or they can uh, get to me through my web page on the book, somefuntonight.com. Uh, they can email me at uh, Gunderson910 at AOL.com. I'm still one of those old AOL guys who will never give up. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be vintage one of these days, I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah, well, and congrats. as for the rest of us, as for the rest of us, Al, if people want to get in contact with you. Uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at a S U S S, uh, four nine, uh, at, uh, through Beetle fan magazine, uh, www.beetlefan.com and, uh, parade www.paradingpress.com for, uh, uh, changing times, 101 days that shape the generation. Okay. And how about you, Steve? My email address will not be changing. It's, it will always be Beatles, or for the time being, it will be BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. You can catch me on Facebook under my name and in my um, my Beatles group, Beatles News and Commentary. I also want to mention that the show is available besides Podbean on YouTube, and it's also on iTunes, so you can find us all over the place. That's right. right. And if you want to uh, send us an email to the group, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page at things we said today. And on Twitter, you can reach us, Steve. Things we said fab. Okay. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. You can always email me directly at every little thing at att.net. And don't forget on my website, there's weekly Beatles trivia. And you can win the brand new compilation of Pure McCartney. So, Chuck, it has been great to have you here on the show. And uh, Thanks again. On behalf of, thank you, Chuck. Thank you. And on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, Chuck Gunderson, and myself, Ken Michaels, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.